a vast nuclear submarine powers through the icy waters of the Arctic. This is Kursk, the billion dollar pride of the Russian fleet. Suddenly, an explosion tears through the front of the sub. Seconds later, another massive blast rips through the boat. Catastrophic flooding sends her to the sea floor. But how could this have happened? Kursk is supposed to be unsinkable. Now we reveal what really took a state-of-the-art nuclear submarine to the bottom of the Barents Sea. Disasters don't just happen. They're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Northern Europe. Russia. August 10th, 2000. Naval dockyards across the Kola Peninsula are buzzing with preparations for the biggest exercise the Russian Navy has seen since the collapse of communism. Over 30 vessels will be involved, including six submarines. It'll be a show of strength for a nation under siege. The civil war in Chechnya has taken a new and menacing turn with a spate of suicide attacks across Russia. The entire country is on edge, and this exercise aims to restore confidence in the Federation's power. 9 p.m. The submarine Kursk is undergoing final engineering checks in the highly restricted Zapadnaya Lista naval dockyard. Created to attack American aircraft carrier battlegroups, she's at the cutting edge of Russia's defenses. Powered by two nuclear reactors, She's 150 meters long and as high as a six-story building. More than twice the size of a jumbo jet. Kursk's unique double-skinned hull and nine watertight compartments mean that she can take a direct hit from a torpedo and survive. <laughs> Lieutenant Captain Dmitry Kolesnikov is enjoying a final cigarette before boarding Kursk. This is Dmitry's 27th birthday and he's missing his new wife. Olga and Dmitri were married only four months ago. Our wedding was in April 2000. It was very modest because we were in a hurry. Soon after they were married, Dmitri gave his new wife a tour of the Kursk. He wanted Olga to feel the same confidence in the submarine that he did. I did not expect a submarine to be so enormous. The tour takes in the torpedo room. Next to this, is the command center. Towards the back of the boat, Dmitri shows Olga the propulsion control station, where he is section captain. When she gets to some of Kursk's more unusual features, a sauna and a swimming pool, Olga can see why Dmitri is so happy on Kursk. I could see she had a right to be loved. The sub has two escape hatches and an escape pod big enough to evacuate the entire crew in one go. Olga is satisfied that Dmitri is on board one of the safest submarines in the Navy's history. 9.30 p.m. Dmitri rejoins his crewmates. Although this mission will be a five-day exercise, Kursk and her crew are always prepared for real combat and the sub bristles with weapons. She carries 24 cruise missiles in silos on each side of the fin. And in Kursk's bow is her torpedo room. There are six torpedo tubes and space for 24 torpedoes. The crew has been joined by Mamed Gadjev, a torpedo engineer on board to monitor some experimental torpedo batteries. Gajiev is from Dagestan, which borders the troubled Chechen region. At 10.30 p.m., in the half-light of an Arctic summer's evening, Kursk puts to sea. Friday, August 11th, in the Barents Sea, 140 kilometers from shore, 
the naval exercise is in full swing. Kursk will take part in a simulated attack with Russian ships substituting for the Americans. Her commander is Captain Gennady Lyachin, an unashamed product of the Soviet system, one of the Navy's most experienced men. 2 p.m. The crew prepares to launch a cruise missile. Their target is Peter the Great, the flagship of the Northern Fleet. In the cash-starved Russian Navy, it's very unusual to fire a real missile, and the men are nervous. They know that Russia has a secret history of accidents with these weapons. In 1989, the sub Komsomolets developed a fuel fire in a missile silo. An emergency blow brought the sub to the surface, but her nuclear reactors were shut down. Helpless without power, the fire destroyed the sub and she sank, killing 41 sailors. With the missile safely away, Kursk melts back into the ocean. She can stay hidden beneath the waves virtually indefinitely, thanks to her nuclear heart. In control of the reactors is Alexei Mirchayev. This is his first mission on Kursk. But despite his lack of experience, Alexei is well aware of his awesome responsibilities. If there's any sign of an emergency, he'll be expected to seal himself into his compartment, sharing the same fate as the reactors. Saturday, August 12th, day two. Kursk is now ready to begin the final phase of her mission. She'll fire two practice torpedoes at the enemy battle group. It's now 11 a.m. The commander gives the order to prepare torpedo tube number four for launch. The crew are excited. Kursk hasn't launched a torpedo for nearly two years. This practice torpedo is 65 centimeters wide. It's 11 meters long and weighs four and a half tons. The crew call these big torpedoes fat girls. Like all practice torpedoes, there's no warhead on the front, just a dummy weight to balance the weapon. It's 11.08 a.m. The commander has decided to make his attack from close to the surface. He looks for enemy ships and spots the distant target. Satisfied that it's Peter the Great, he can proceed with his plan. He orders a single sonar pulse to calculate the target's distance. The battle group will be fired on by six subs as it passes through the exercise area. Kursk is second in line. 1117. The commander gives the order to slow to six knots. The instructions are passed to the rear of the sub, where, in propulsion control, Dmitry Kolesnikov knows that such a slow speed means the commander is preparing to fire the torpedo. 11.20. The fat girl is finally slid into position. As the torpedo door closes, an electrical connection is made between the torpedo and a monitoring system. It's 11.27 and 30 seconds. The commander takes a final look in the periscope. Kursk is poised to launch the first of her torpedoes at the enemy battle group. A shockwave bursts through the command center. The crew are slammed to the floor. Toxic smoke pours into the room. Kursk is now on a knife edge. Surrounded by about 100 tons of high explosives, 24 cruise missiles, and two nuclear reactors, Kursk is seconds from nuclear disaster. A 
An explosion tears through the torpedo room of the giant Russian submarine Kursk. The blast reverberates down the length of the boat. Although seriously injured, the captain knows that the only way to save the ship is to get it to the surface as quickly as possible. He orders his crew to perform an emergency blow. But no one can respond. 70 meters from the source of the explosion, in the reactor control room, Alexei's training kicks in. His first instinct is to check if the reactors have been damaged. The rookie submariner quickly sees that both reactors are working normally, for now. Alexei knows that the reactors are separated from the hull by powerful shock absorbers and can withstand a jolt of 50 times normal gravity. But if Kursk's massive arsenal explodes, the shock absorbers will be useless. Kursk could become the biggest dirty bomb in history. Alexei seals himself into his compartment. He desperately tries to reach the command post, but there's no response. In the command post, the air has become superheated and poisonous. The commander and most of the men are dead. With no word from the commander, Alexei braces himself to shut down the reactors. Eleven thirty. One hundred and thirty-five seconds after the first explosion, another detonation rips through the front of Kursk. Alexei makes his decision, but is it too late? Control rods slam into the reactor cores and the nuclear reactors shut down. Dmitri and his men lie where they've fallen and wait for the inevitable impact on the seabed. It's 20 seconds since the explosion. 40 kilometers away, Admiral Popov, commander of the Northern Fleet, is on board Peter the Great, observing the torpedo exercises. A massive shock wave passes through the ship. Sonar specialist, Lieutenant Labyrinyuk, logs the location of the source of the shock wave. Eleven thirty-one. Dmitry Kolesnikov and his crewmates are amazed that they're alive. But could the reactors still blow? Dmitry immediately asks about the state of the reactors. To his relief, he learns that they're safely locked down. The nuclear threat is over. But Dmitry knows that he and his men now face a desperate fight for survival. Although only 27, Dmitry Kolesnikov assumes command. The men know from the scale of the damage that they won't be able to reach the escape pod in the fin. The only way out for them is through the rear escape hatch, right at the back of the submarine. One fifteen p.m. Aboard Peter the Great, Admiral Popov considers an unexpected turn of events in the exercise. Fusik submarines have reported successful missions. Only Kursk is silent. Admiral Popov decides there's no reason to raise the alarm yet. Kursk is, after all, unsinkable. One thirty p.m. Two hours since the explosions. A sailor beats out the special hammering code that'll locate their position to rescue us. Meanwhile, Dmitry Kolesnikov calls for the men to yell out their names and carefully writes them down. 
he begins to log the events that have brought the men to compartment 9. 11.30 p.m. 12 hours after Kursk was ripped apart by two explosions, the Russian fleet finally declares an emergency. A full-scale search and rescue operation begins. And the Navy's submarine rescue squad is scrambled. On Peter the Great, the sonar operator identifies the location of the underwater explosion that he logged that morning. It will not be easy to find Kursk. Her outer hull is covered in a six centimeter thick layer of rubber, which absorbs sonar pulses, making her almost impossible to detect. At 4.30 in the morning, after a five hour search, Kursk is finally located by Peter the Great's sonar operator. Monday, August 14th. Across Russia, news is leaking out about a submarine disaster. Russia has two high-tech surveillance subs, which could provide vital support for the rescue squad. But they're unavailable. Out on private hire, near the wreck of Titanic, five and a half thousand kilometers away. Instead, the operation will be down to the fleet's three remaining rescue subs. But years of neglect have left these in poor condition, and their crews have had little training. Nevertheless, the submersibles try to connect with Kursk. But none of them can make a watertight seal with the rear escape hatch. The Russian Navy's attempt to rescue the men is a total failure. Now the whole world is following the events in the Barents Sea. Thank you very much, Mike. And under growing international pressure, the Russians ask a joint Norwegian and British team to launch a rescue mission. At 7.45 a.m. on Monday, August 21st, nine days after she sank, divers finally managed to open Kursk's outer escape hatch. But when they open the lower hatch, they find the submarine is flooded. All the 118 men are dead. The first body to be recovered is Dmitry Kolesnikovs. A note is found in his pocket. It includes the list of the 23 men who survived the blast only to die in compartment 9. And it contains his farewell to his wife. It is dark in here to write, but I'll try by feel. It seems that there are no chances, maybe 10 to 20 percent. Let's hope that at least someone will read this. Regards to everybody. No need to be desperate. But how could the unsinkable Kursk be so completely destroyed? What crisis could develop so quickly that the crew are unable to bring the submarine to the surface? And why did no one manage to escape? Now, by rewinding the events of that day, and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened to Kursk and her crew. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. The fiasco of the Russian rescue attempt shocks the world. But for those with an intimate knowledge of how Russia works, the reaction is very different. I was getting increasingly angry, really. I knew the attitude of the Russian military, which was always to protect its image. In the year 2000, Lord Truscott is the British government's special advisor on the Russian Federation. Married to a Russian, he has high-level connections in both Russia and the West. Truscott sees that the Russian Navy is looking both incompetent and vulnerable, and expects the worst. I was thinking that a cover-up was entirely possible. The official Russian investigation begins in secret, and Lord Truscott knows there's little chance that its findings will be made public. So he decides to begin his own investigation. But he knows it'll be far from easy. If you go to the Russian military and say, tell me exactly what happened with your nuclear submarine, then they'll just blank you. In fact, there's even a danger that you could be accused of espionage. 
Utilizing his unique contacts, Truscott begins to sift what little information he can find. I considered all theories that came forward and I looked at every one. A Chechen news agency makes the astonishing claim that a crewman blew up both Kursk and himself in support of Muslim fighters in Chechnya. There were Russian soldiers being killed in Chechnya at the time. People were thinking about Chechen terrorism. So when the Kursk went down, people thought, could this possibly be a terrorist attack? But who would have had access to the bow of the submarine? And who would have been motivated to plant a bomb? There were two men on board from Russia's Muslim territories, and one had access to the torpedo room. Mehmed Gajiev comes under intense scrutiny. Truscott discovers that Gajiev had volunteered for the job of monitoring the torpedo batteries, positioning him right at the front of the sub. Could Gajiev have been a suicide bomber? Truscott uses his high-level contacts to check him out. These were people working with highly secret weapons. When I did look into the background of Mamed Gadiev, he was a good, loyal member of the Navy. There was no reason to think that this was any kind of planned terrorist operation. It's clear that Gadiev's presence on Kursk has been exploited as easy propaganda. Terrorism is ruled out. But the mystery is no nearer being solved. Then the Russian Navy starts to promote another theory about what sank the Kursk. A collision with a foreign submarine. They know that the Northern Fleet was not alone in the Barents Sea at the time of Kursk's disappearance. At least two NATO submarines were spying on the Russian exercise. And Truscott discovers that this game of cat and mouse regularly ends with an unintentional underwater impact. The Russian Navy has documented 25 cases of submarine collisions since 1967. And Truscott's special contacts tell him that even the British Navy thinks a collision is what sank Kursk. The first thing that they thought was the Kursk has probably hit a, an American submarine in the Barents Sea and gone down. But there is no hard evidence. Then the Russian Navy publishes a satellite photograph of a U.S. submarine, the USS Memphis, in a Norwegian military dockyard, taken only seven days after Kursk sinks. For the Russians, this is evidence that the sub has been damaged. The Americans categorically deny that Memphis has been involved in any collision. That uh, there were no American ships uh, involved. The Russian Navy is not so dismissive. They call a press conference and show video footage of what looks like a large gash down the side of Kursk. They insist it is evidence of a collision. If not Memphis, then another sub, perhaps a British one, is responsible. Kursk is becoming a political hot potato. And the British Ministry of Defense feels obliged to look into the collision theory. If NATO submarines are being blamed, they need to know the truth. They get just the break they need when a Norwegian seismic facility announces that it's detected an unusual seismic event in the Barents Sea at the approximate time of Kursk's disappearance. Could this echo of Kursk's death throes contain evidence for a collision? The British government obtains this crucial data and sends it to expert seismologist David Bowers. The amount of information in these seismograms is remarkable. Bowers compares the shape of the event to a database of other seismic signals. It doesn't match the distinctive pattern of an earthquake or a collision. It matches exactly the patterns of known underwater explosions. The explosion was very large, it's equivalent to about five tons of TNT. Bowers continues to examine the trace. He moves backwards in time. Here, 135 seconds earlier, he finds another seismic event, almost invisible in the background noise. It's 100 times smaller than the second event, but still powerful enough to be picked up 400 kilometers away. Could the Russian Navy be right after all?
Could this seismic trace represent a collision which then somehow triggered the second massive explosion? Bowers analyzes the shape of the first event. When he expands its size to match the second bigger event, he sees the evidence he's been looking for. When we compared the signals from the second event with the first event, we found they were remarkably similar. This suggested to us that the first signals were also from an underwater explosion. The first explosion was probably about a hundredth the size of the second, namely about 50 kilograms. Bowers is left in no doubt that both the seismic anomalies are the result of underwater explosions. NATO is off the hook, and the hardliners in the Russian Navy have to accept that an underwater collision is not the cause of the Kursk disaster. Investigators are now confronted with the problem of explaining the two explosions that Bowers uncovered. We knew that there were two explosions, but it was very frustrating because the physical evidence lay at the bottom of the Barents Sea out of reach. As the political fallout of the disaster mounts, President Putin authorizes a radical salvage plan. The Kursk will be raised from the seabed. This will be one of the most ambitious maritime salvages in history. But will it supply the investigation with the breakthrough it needs? Putin allocates $130 million to the task, more than the annual budget for the entire northern submarine fleet. But is it safe to move Kursk? The wreck's two nuclear reactors have been within a few meters of a massive explosion. Could they be damaged? A survey reveals that radiation levels are normal. But investigators decide to perform an additional grisly test. Divers recover bodies from near the reactor compartments. These sailors are found to have suffered extreme skeletal injuries that can only be the result of a massive jolt of around 50 times normal gravity. Truscott knows this is a crucial discovery because the reactors too would have suffered the same shock. That was just horrific, terrifying. This is very much at the limits of reactor design engineering. The reactor's shock absorbers were built to handle just over 50 G. The second blast very nearly overcame them. The chilling truth is that Kursk was on the brink of nuclear disaster. But the survey confirms that the reactors are now stable. The salvage team cuts off Kursk's shattered torpedo room, afraid it'll fall apart if they move it, and slowly raise the rest of the sub to the surface. Fourteen months after she sank, Kursk arrives at a secretive naval dockyard on the Kola Peninsula. Investigators take four days to drain her, careful to preserve the evidence she contains. Forensic specialists begin work on the immense wreck. The first challenge they face is to identify the cause of the devastation that surrounds them. They quickly establish that all the crew's missiles are intact, so their attention turns to Kursk's torpedo arsenal. Although the torpedo room has been left on the seabed, by analyzing the distribution of damage on the remaining wreck, they deduce that between five and seven torpedoes exploded at virtually the same time. This corresponds to the four and a half ton blast predicted by the seismic data. Truscott is confident that the cause of the second killer blast has been identified. But what led to this massive detonation in Kursk's arsenal? The clues must also lie in the tortured remains of the sub. The forensic team established that the front section of the wreck has been incinerated, its contents cooked, in a fire that reached an astonishing 2,000 degrees Celsius, as hot as a blast furnace. Detailed analysis reveals that this fire was raging before the torpedo arsenal exploded. And Truscott realizes that the seismic data has already revealed the likely source of this fire. 
the first small explosion. Discovering the cause of this initial blast is the big question for the investigation. But with the remains of the front of the sub abandoned on the sea floor, Truscott doubts that the critical evidence will ever be recovered. How could you unravel all this when the whole torpedo compartment had been blown to smithereens over the seabed? The investigation was in big trouble. Truscott needs specialist help, so he makes contact with Igor Kordin. A former Russian sub-commander, Kordin has the intimate knowledge of the sub that the investigation craves. Kordin immediately comes up with a candidate for the critical first explosion. One of Kursk's giant emergency batteries. We thought the first explosion was of a sub-battery. Sub-batteries explode quite often on submarines. It's a hydrogen explosion. The last it happens. Around a hundred of these one-ton batteries are located in the lowest level of the first compartment, beneath the torpedo arsenal. They supply emergency power if the reactor is shut down and work just like the battery in a car. As they charge up, they release hydrogen. If the battery leaks, an explosion is possible. These batteries are a potential threat to any sub. But Kordin's battery theory is overtaken by events. A spectacular discovery on the seabed turns the investigation in a new direction. A piece of hull debris from around the number four torpedo hatch is found 50 meters behind the main wreckage site. For this piece of hull to be found in this strange location, way behind the rest of the submarine debris, means that it was the very first thing to be blown off the sub. And its original position on Kursk gives the spot where the blast happened. This was sensational evidence because it proved that the torpedo in tube four was the first thing to explode. And the only question was which part of the torpedo had exploded. Truscott knows that the most obvious candidate for an explosion is the torpedo's warhead. But he discovers that Kursk was about to fire a practice torpedo, which has no warhead. So something else in the torpedo must be to blame. His contacts tell him that when torpedoes are launched, they can travel many kilometers before reaching their target. This means that their propulsion systems often contain more energy than the warhead itself. Truscott looks into the details of the practice torpedo's propulsion system. Stop. The turbine that pushes the torpedo through the water gets its power from burning kerosene. But underwater, where there's no air, the oxygen needed to react with the fuel is stored in the form of concentrated hydrogen peroxide, HTP. On paper, this propulsion system is efficient and foolproof. But Truscott is told that HTP has some disturbing properties. He's advised that when certain metals, or even rust, come into contact with HTP, they act as a catalyst. The hydrogen peroxide breaks down into oxygen and steam and lots of heat. The volume of gas increases 5,000 times in a split second. In a torpedo, this can be a deadly force. I was amazed to discover that HTP torpedoes were extremely dangerous, especially if they weren't handled properly. Truscott uncovers a series of naval accidents involving HTP. The most infamous of these happened in 1955 on a British sub, HMS Sidon. During routine weapons loading, one of her new HTP torpedoes exploded in the launch tube. Thirteen men were killed. The lesson of HMS Sidon was that the world's navy should abandon HTP. And that was learned by everyone, but not by the Soviet Union. Could Kursk be another victim of this chemical time bomb? Igor Kurdin examines the possibility that an HTP propulsion system could be at the root of the Kursk disaster. He begins by calculating the likely explosive yield of the propulsion system. The result is between 50 and 100 kilos of TNT, roughly the same size as the explosion on the seismic trace. With the numbers stacking up, 
an HTP accident looks increasingly likely. But Quodin knows that all HTP torpedoes have safety features aimed at preventing dangerous pressurization inside the torpedo. Could the torpedo's safety systems have been damaged? Quodin uses his special contacts to obtain the maintenance records of Kursk's practice torpedo. What he discovers shocks the veteran commander. The torpedo came from a batch of 10 made in 1990. Six of these were immediately rejected because of faulty welding. He's told that the welding on the practice torpedo was never checked. It was thought unnecessary because it didn't have a warhead. Igor Kordin is forced to conclude that shoddy welding probably allowed HTP to leak out of the practice torpedo with terrifying consequences. But where is the proof? A painstaking search through the thousands of metal fragments recovered from Kursk eventually pays off. Parts of both the torpedo and the launch tube are found with distortions and heat damage that are consistent with the torpedo exploding about halfway down its length, right by a critical weld. But the elaborate HTP theory raises more questions than it answers. First of all, Truscott knows that the torpedo launch tubes are designed to fail safe. The inner door is three times stronger than the outer door. So an explosion inside the tube should be directed into the sea, not into the sub. The second problem is that the relatively small size of the HTP explosion should not have been able to penetrate the bulkhead that separates the command post from the torpedo room. This was a mystery to us. The yield of the first wave was enough for those people in the second compartment to be left unconscious. The only way these paradoxes can be resolved is by revisiting Kursk's rusting hulk. The exhausted forensic team eventually finds the inner launch tube door embedded in the first bulkhead, 12 meters from its original position. Examination of the door reveals that although it was closed at the time of the explosion, it wasn't fully locked down, compromising its strength. With his years of experience, Kurdin realizes why the door could have been unlocked. The electrical connection between the torpedo and the tube door is notorious for getting clogged with dust. The crew often have to open the tube door several times to clean the connection before they can complete their systems checks. Kurdin thinks that pure bad luck means the door is only partially closed when the HTP reaction ruptures the torpedo. This leaves the investigation with one outstanding problem. How did this small explosion manage to knock out the command post, leaving Kursk helpless? It was clear that the HTP torpedo was the cause of the first blast, but why was that powerful enough to overcome the command post and stop the Kursk from saving itself? An emergency blow takes just seconds to implement. But even this most basic emergency procedure didn't happen. It really was perplexing. The answer to this mystery would send shockwaves through the Russian fleet and ultimately shed new light on the terrible fate of Dmitry and his 22 comrades. Shoddy welding has led to a torpedo explosion in the front compartment of Kursk. The bulkhead should have contained the blast, but it didn't. Once again, Truscott consults expert submariner Igor Kurdin. Kurdin knows that the bulkhead separating the first two compartments should have been easily strong enough to contain the first explosion in the torpedo room. So he starts to look for potential weak spots in the design of the front part of the submarine. His suspicions quickly focus on the ventilation system. He notices that a ventilation duct carries air in a circuit that covers the first four compartments. 
40 centimeters in diameter, the duct penetrates the reinforced bulkheads, but itself is made of light alloy. It's just a usual ventilation pipe, just like in a house or in an office. When the explosion happened, the ventilation pipe burst immediately. The pressure wave from the first explosion simply traveled down this duct and exploded into the command post, shattering the ducting and feeding flame and smoke into the compartment. Before they can even press the emergency alarm, they're overcome by the fire, smoke, it's total wipeout. Lord Truscott can now put together the chain of events that left this Russian super sub and her crew seconds from disaster. August 12th. 2000. Five minutes and 30 seconds to disaster. Kursk prepares to launch a practice torpedo at Peter the Great. As the commander maneuvers Kursk, in the front of the sub, the torpedo is leaking HTP into the launch tube, and a puddle of HTP forms. The torpedo crew open the tube to clean the electrical connection. 135 seconds to disaster. The liquid contacts a patch of rust and instantly expands 5,000 times in volume. The pressure spike shatters the torpedo casing and splits the kerosene tank. Superheated steam ignites the kerosene which burns the free oxygen and a fireball fills the torpedo room, killing the men instantly. The blast wave burst through the ventilation pipe into the command center. As seawater jets in through the launch tube, Kursk begins a gentle dive. Now there are 21 torpedoes being cooked in a fire, fueled by 500 kilos of kerosene. As the internal temperature of the warheads reaches 400 degrees Celsius, they will spontaneously explode. 11.30 and 15 seconds. Catastrophe. In less than a fifth of a second, up to seven torpedoes explode. The supersonic blast slices through Kursk's watertight bulkheads and hurtles towards the nuclear reactors. But the reactor shock absorbers cushion the 50G acceleration and the bulkheads contain the blast wave. Control rods slam into the reactor cores, stopping the nuclear chain reactions. Meanwhile, at the front of the sub, the pressure hull is stressed way beyond its limits. The five centimeter thick steel tube bursts and water explodes into the boat through the 70 meter long hole. Just minutes after the first explosion, the pride of the Russian fleet lies a wreck on the muddy bed of the Barents Sea, a tomb for 118 men. With the recovery of the bodies, pathologists conclude that for most of the sailors, the end was swift. But 23 men at the rear of the sub clung on to life for up to eight hours after the explosions. Igor Kurdin uses a lifetime's experience to create the full horrific account of their struggle for survival. The men are only 108 meters below the surface, and they've been trained to ascend from this depth in their escape suits, one by one, through the hatch. But it's dangerous. If no one spots them when they reach the surface, they'll freeze to death. To go up into the open sea, they'd be carried out into the open ocean, get frozen and get lost without trace. They were waiting for one ship to be above the submarine. The sailors have plenty of food and water, and there's enough air in the compartment to last for several days, if they're careful. But each time the men breathe out, they exhale carbon dioxide. Even at low concentrations, this toxic gas can kill. To counteract this threat, the sub is fitted with air scrubbers, chemical plates designed to strip the CO2 out of the air. In the thickening atmosphere, the sailors hang the scrubbers from the pipes. Kurdin discovers that the sailors' fate is linked to these life-saving devices. 
The forensic report describes evidence of a fire in compartment 9 and air scrubber cartridges are found in the fire debris. Cordin knows that these cartridges explode into a vicious chemical fire if they come into contact with oil or water. A dreadful picture of the sailors' last moments is forming. The men are hanging up another cartridge, but in the darkness and the cold, they're becoming clumsy. The cartridge falls into the oily water. The chemical reaction starts a fire. This sucks oxygen out of the air, leaving the men to breathe in carbon monoxide from the flames. Death follows quickly. You know, on one hand, I'm proud of Mitya, because in such terrible circumstances, Mitya was able to pull himself together and not lose control over himself and others. But on the other hand, I think this kind of death is a hellish death. I think if it's time to die, let the death be instant. In the wake of the disaster, the Navy removes all HTP torpedoes from Russian submarines. But the official report finds no individual is to blame. No one will ever know for sure if nuclear technician Alexei Mityaev took the decision to shut down the reactors. If he did, then his heroic action may have prevented another Chernobyl. Most of the sailors' bodies are returned to their families across Russia. And a memorial is created in St. Petersburg to honor them. The Kursk disaster is often seen as a metaphor for the decay of the Soviet Union. But I see the bravery of the Russian crew really as a sign of hope for Russia and the future.